The Coward, a short story by Guy de Maupassant. In society, he was called Handsome Signol. His name was Vicomte Gontran Joseph de Signol. An orphan and possessed of an ample fortune, he cut quite a dash, as it is called. He had an attractive appearance and manner, could talk well, had a certain inborn elegance, an air of pride and nobility, a good moustache and a tender eye that always finds favour with women. He was in great request at receptions, waltzed to perfection, and was regarded by his own sex with that smiling hostility accorded to the popular society man. He had been suspected of more than one love affair, calculated to enhance the reputation of a bachelor. He lived a happy, peaceful life, a life of physical and mental well-being. He had won considerable fame as a swordsman and still more as a marksman. When the time comes for me to fight a duel, he said, I shall choose pistols. With such a weapon, I am sure to kill my man. One evening, having accompanied two women friends of his with their husbands to the theatre, he invited them to take some ice cream at Tortoni's after the performance. They had been seated a few minutes in the restaurant when Signoles noticed that a man was staring persistently at one of the ladies. She seemed annoyed and lowered her eyes. At last, she said to her husband, There's a man over there looking at me. I don't know him, do you? The husband, who had noticed nothing, glanced across at the offender and said, No, not in the least. His wife continued, half smiling, half angry. It's very tiresome. He quite spoils my ice cream. The husband shrugged his shoulders. Nonsense. Don't take any notice of him. If we were to bother our heads about all the ill-mannered people, we should have no time for anything else. But the vicomte abruptly left his seat. He could not allow this insolent fellow to spoil an ice for a guest of his. It was for him to take cognizance of the offence, since it was through him that his friends had come to the restaurant. He went across to the man and said, Sir, you are staring at those ladies in a manner I cannot permit. I must ask you to desist from your rudeness. The other replied, Let me alone, will you? Take care, sir, said the vicomte between his teeth, or you will force me to extreme measures. The man replied with a single word, a foul word, which could be heard from one end of the restaurant to the other, and which startled everyone there. All those whose backs were toward the two disputants turned round, all the others raised their heads. Three waiters spun round on their heels like tops. The two lady cashiers jumped as if shot, then turned their bodies simultaneously like two automata worked by the same spring. There was dead silence. Then suddenly a sharp, crisp sound. The vicomte had slapped his adversary's face. Everyone rose to interfere. Cards were exchanged. When the vicomte reached home, he walked rapidly up and down his room for some minutes. He was in a state of too great agitation to think connectedly. One idea alone possessed him a duel. But this idea aroused in him as yet no emotion of any kind. He had done what he was bound to do. He had proved himself to be what he ought to be. He would be talked about, approved, congratulated. He repeated aloud, speaking as one does when under the stress of great mental disturbance, what a brute of a man. Then he sat down and began to reflect. He would have to find seconds as soon as morning came. Whom should he choose? He bethought himself of the most influential and best-known men of his acquaintance. His choice fell at last on the Marquis de la Tour Noire and Colonel Bourdin, a nobleman and a soldier. That would be just the thing. Their names would carry weight in the newspapers. He was thirsty and drank three glasses of water, one after another. Then he walked up and down again. If he showed himself brave, Determined, prepared to face a duel in deadly earnest, his adversary would probably draw back and proffer excuses. He picked up the card he had taken from his pocket and thrown on a table. He read it again, as he had already read it, first at a glance in the restaurant and afterward on the way home in the light of each gas lamp. Georges Lamille, 51 Rue Moncey. That was all. He examined closely this collection of letters, which seemed to him mysterious, fraught with many meanings. Georges Lamille, who was the man? 
What was his profession? Why had he stared so at the woman? Was it not monstrous that a stranger, an unknown, should thus all at once upset one's whole life, simply because it had pleased him to stare rudely at a woman? And the vicomte once more repeated aloud, What a brute! Then he stood motionless, thinking, his eyes still fixed on the card. Anger rose in his heart against this scrap of paper, a resentful anger mingled with a strange sense of uneasiness. It was a stupid business altogether. He took up a penknife which lay open within reach and deliberately stuck it into the middle of the printed name as if he were stabbing someone. So he would have to fight. Should he choose swords or pistols? For he considered himself as the insulted party. With the sword, he would risk less. But with the pistol, there was some chance of his adversary backing out. A duel with swords is rarely fatal since mutual prudence prevents the combatants from fighting close enough to each other for a point to enter very deep. With pistols, he would seriously risk his life, but on the other hand, he might come out of the affair with flying colours and without a duel after all. I must be firm, he said. The fellow will be afraid. The sound of his own voice startled him, and he looked nervously round the room. He felt unstrung. He drank another glass of water and then began undressing, preparatory to going to bed. As soon as he was in bed, he blew out the light and shut his eyes. I have all day tomorrow, he reflected, for setting my affairs in order. I must sleep now in order to be calm when the time comes. He was very warm in bed, but he could not succeed in losing consciousness. He tossed and turned, remained for five minutes lying on his back, then changed to his left side, then rolled over to his right. He was thirsty again and rose to drink. Then a qualm seized him. Can it be possible that I am afraid? Why did his heart beat so uncontrollably at every well-known sound in his room? When the clock was about to strike, the prefatory grating of its spring made him start, and for several seconds he panted for breath, so unnerved was he. He began to reason with himself on the possibility of such a thing. Could I by any chance be afraid? No, indeed, he could not be afraid, since he was resolved to proceed to the last extremity, since he was irrevocably determined to fight without flinching. And yet he was so perturbed in mind and body that he asked himself, Is it possible to be afraid in spite of oneself? And this doubt, this fearful question, took possession of him. If an irresistible power, stronger than his own will, were to quell his courage, what would happen? He would certainly go to the place appointed, his will would force him that far, but supposing, when there, he were to tremble or faint, and he thought of his social standing, his reputation, his name, and he suddenly determined to get up and look at himself in the glass. He lighted his candle. When he saw his face reflected in the mirror, he scarcely recognized it. He seemed to see before him a man whom he did not know. His eyes looked disproportionately large, and he was very pale. He remained standing before the mirror. He put out his tongue as if to examine the state of his health, and all at once the thought flashed into his mind. At this time, the day after tomorrow, I may be dead. And his heart throbbed painfully. At this time, the day after tomorrow, I may be dead. This person in front of me, this. I, whom I see in the glass, will perhaps be no more. What? Here I am, I look at myself. I feel myself to be alive. And yet in twenty-four hours I may be lying on that bed with closed eyes, dead, cold, inanimate. He turned round and could see himself distinctly lying on his back on the couch he had just quitted. He had the hollow face and the limp hands of death. Then he became afraid of his bed, and to avoid seeing it, went to his smoking room. He mechanically took a cigar, lighted it, and began walking back and forth. He was cold. He took a step toward the bell to wake his valet, but stopped with hand raised toward the bell rope. He would see that I am afraid. And instead of ringing, he made a fire himself. His hands quivered nervously as they touched various objects. His head grew dizzy, his thoughts confused, disjointed, 
painful. A numbness seized his spirit as if he had been drinking, and all the time he kept on saying, What shall I do? What will become of me? His whole body trembled spasmodically. He rose and, going to the window, drew back the curtains. The day, a summer day, was breaking. The pink sky cast a glow on the city, its roofs and its walls. A flush of light enveloped the awakened world like a caress from the rising sun, and the glimmer of dawn kindled new hope in the breast of the vicomte. What a fool he was to let himself succumb to fear before anything was decided, before his seconds had interviewed those of Georges Lamille, before he even knew whether he would have to fight or not. He bathed, dressed, and left the house with a firm step. He repeated as he went, I must be firm, very firm. I must show that I am not afraid. His seconds, the Marquis and the Colonel, placed themselves at his disposal, and having shaken him warmly by the hand, began to discuss details. You want a serious duel? asked the Colonel. Yes, quite serious, replied the Vicount. You insist on pistols? put in the Marquis. Yes. Do you leave all the other arrangements in our hands? With a dry, jerky voice, the Vicomte answered, Twenty paces, at a given signal, the arm to be raised, not lowered, shots to be exchanged until one or other is seriously wounded. Excellent conditions, declared the Colonel in a satisfied tone. You are a good shot. All the chances are in your favour. And they parted. The Vicomte returned home to wait for them. His agitation, only temporarily allayed, now increased momentarily. He felt, in arms, legs and chest, a sort of trembling, a continuous vibration. He could not stay still, either sitting or standing. His mouth was parched, and he made every now and then a clicking movement of the tongue, as if to detach it from his palate. He attempted to take luncheon, but could not eat. Then it occurred to him to seek courage in drink, and he sent for a decanter of rum, of which he swallowed, one after another, six small glasses. A burning warmth, followed by a deadening of the mental faculties, ensued. He said to himself, I know how to manage. Now it will be all right. But at the end of an hour he had emptied the decanter, and his agitation was worse than ever. A mad longing possessed him to throw himself on the ground, to bite, to scream. Night fell. A ring at the bell so unnerved him that he had not the strength to rise to receive his seconds. He dared not even to speak to them, wish them good day, utter a single word, lest his changed voice should betray him. All is arranged as you wished, said the colonel. Your adversary claimed at first the privilege of the offended part but he yielded almost at once and accepted your conditions. His seconds are two military men. Thank you, said the Vicomte. The Marquis added, Please excuse us if we do not stay now, for we have a good deal to see to yet. We shall want a reliable doctor, since the duel is not to end until a serious wound has been inflicted, and you know that bullets are not to be trifled with. We must select a spot near some house to which the wounded party can be carried if necessary. In fact, the arrangements will take us another two or three hours at least. The Vicomte articulated for the second time. Thank you. You're all right? asked the Colonel. Quite calm? Perfectly calm, thank you. The two men withdrew. When he was once more alone, he felt as though he should go mad. His servant, having lighted the lamps, he sat down at his table to write some letters. When he had traced at the top of a sheet of paper the words, This is my last will and testament, he started from his seat, feeling himself incapable of connected thought, of decision in regard to anything. So he was going to fight. He could no longer avoid it. What, then, possessed him? He wished to fight, he was fully determined to fight, and yet, in spite of all his mental effort, in spite of the exertion of all his willpower, he felt that he could not even preserve the strength necessary to carry him through the ordeal. He tried to conjure up a picture of the duel, his own attitude, and that of his enemy. Every now and then his teeth chattered audibly. He thought he would read, and took down Chateau Villard's rules of dueling. Then he said, 
Is the other man practiced in the use of the pistol? Is he well known? How can I find out? He remembered Baron de Vaux's book on marksmen and searched it from end to end. Georges Lamille was not mentioned. And yet, if he were not an adept, would he have accepted without demure such a dangerous weapon and such deadly conditions? He opened a case of Gastine Renette, which stood on a small table, and took from it a pistol. Next he stood in the correct attitude for firing and raised his arm, but he was trembling from head to foot, and the weapon shook in his grasp. Then he said to himself, It is impossible. I cannot fight like this. He looked at the little black, death-spitting hole at the end of the pistol. He thought of dishonour, of the whispers at the clubs, the smiles in his friends' drawing rooms, the contempt of women, the veiled sneers of the newspapers, the insults that would be hurled at him by cowards. He still looked at the weapon, and raising the hammer, saw the glitter of the priming below it. The pistol had been left loaded by some chance, some oversight, and the discovery rejoiced him. He knew not why. If he did not maintain, in presence of his opponent, the steadfast bearing which was so necessary to his honour, he would be ruined forever. He would be branded, stigmatised as a coward, hounded out of society, and he felt he knew that he could not maintain that calm, unmoved demeanour. And yet he was brave, since the thought that followed was not even rounded to a finish in his mind, but opening his mouth wide, he suddenly plunged the barrel of the pistol as far back as his throat and pressed the trigger. When the valet, alarmed at the report, rushed into the room, he found his master lying dead upon his back. A spurt of blood had splashed the white paper on the table and had made a great crimson stain beneath the words, This is my last will and testament.